Chapter Twenty: Wolf's Eye Surprise. Instantly, Bess and George darted from their hiding places and grabbed the woman. She was surprised and fought them violently, but they pinned her arms back and held her tightly until Nancy could stand up, grab her flashlight, and come forward. This time, she turned the light on herself. Nancy drew. The woman cried out. Bess and George were astounded. "Do you know each other?" George asked. "Yes," Nancy said quietly. "Celia was a day maid for my aunt Eloise Drew in New York for many years. In fact, until she married." "Oh, Nancy, I'm so sorry I hit you," Celia Smith wailed. "I had no idea it was you speaking." When I sent you that moonstone, I was trying to save you from that dreadful gang. They're really after you. My husband is getting more and more desperate. He'll stop at nothing. Who is your husband? Nancy asked. Rudy Raspin. So that's why he looked vaguely familiar to me. The young sleuth said, "You once showed me a photograph of your fiance." But you never told me his name. The girls now learned that Celia had been very unhappy since her marriage five years before. Rudy's cruel and ruthless, but I was afraid to leave him. I learned what he and his friends are up to. He always said if I got him in trouble, he'd kill me. You poor woman, Nancy said sympathetically. What is this racket? Celia replied that there were several couples in the group. One couple would talk a wealthy, usually elderly woman who had no relatives to look after her, into employing them as servants. They always insisted that any other servants leave before their arrival. In this way, the new employees never could be identified. The main idea was to rob the woman of as much as possible. And in some cases, starve them to death," said George. Celia Smith looked at the girl in alarm. "Is that true?" she asked. "I'm sure my husband never resorted to that," but she said, "The gang told me very little. They didn't trust me. Most of what I know, I overheard. The gang threatened me a great deal. They were afraid, I guess, that I might go to the police." How long has this racket been going on? Nancy asked. Oh, a long time. Was the first victim Mrs. Horton? Nancy inquired. Celia Smith nodded. That happened long before I married Rudy, but I found out about it. The Omans went there as servants. They learned that Mrs. Horton's little granddaughter was being brought there by her other grandparents, who were going to Africa. During the missionary's short stay, the Omans were absent. They claimed that they were attending their daughter's wedding in New York. Clara Oman found out that Mrs. Horton was Joni's only living relative outside of her maternal grandparents, so they planned that whole horrible kidnapping. It was carried out at the time of Mrs. Horton's death. They gave the poor little girl a sedative to put her to sleep. Then took her to the adoption society office and left her. Where is Joni Horton now? Bess asked. I don't know, and I'm sure my husband and the other members of the gang don't either. I did find this out, though. They kept track of what happened to Mister and Missus Bowen. When they returned from Africa and came here, Ben shadowed them. When they asked your father to take the case. Rudy was determined that Mister Drew was not going to learn the truth. Next, he found out from eavesdropping at your River Heights home that you girls were coming here to do some sleuthing. You have been in danger ever since. Oh! Exclaimed Bess. I took my husband's moonstone. Celia went on. He had brought it from Salon years ago and prizes it highly. I sent the stone to you, Nancy, with the note. You are so smart 
I thought you would find out sooner or later the significance of Moonstone and Moonstone Valley. Nancy said that it had taken her a long time to put the clues together, and there were many questions still unanswered. One of them is, where does the castle fit into the puzzle? All I know is that they used it as a meeting place. Suddenly, Celia bit her lip and said with determination, I'm never going back to Rudy Raspin. I don't care what happens to me. He is a wicked person, and I'm glad he has been found out. I'm sorry, Nancy, that I ever got mixed up in this racket. I should have gone to the police long ago. Suppose you tell me, said Nancy, where they can find your husband. Celia answered without hesitation, We work for a senile, well-to-do old man, Mr. Horace Boise, in the next town, Pleasantville. Nancy invited Celia to come to the girls' room in the motel and talk further. I'll go to your car with you, and we'll drive it up to the motel's parking lot, she said. To George, she murmured, call the police and tell them where they can find Raspin. Ten minutes later, Celia and the three girls met in the bedroom. Although Mrs. Raspin was teary-eyed, she looked relieved that at last she had followed her conscience. In answer to questions from Nancy, she revealed that it was her husband who had been chased from the Drew home by Detective Donnelly. He had hoped to break into the house and look for any papers on the Horton matter that might incriminate him. Raspin also phoned Mr. and Mrs. Bowen in an attempt to keep Nancy from going to Deep River. O-Man had posed as Mr. Seaman and given a phony address to keep people from knowing where he worked. He had convinced Mrs. Horton that her money would be safer in one large city bank and her securities in a home safe, so she had transferred all her funds. Mrs. O-Man had forged two notes in Grandmother Horton's handwriting, One gave a New York City address as that of her granddaughter. The other requested the private funeral. The note to Mr. Wheeler was genuine, but the papers used by the fake Joan were forged by her mother. Suggs had signaled messages to the O-mans about visitors to the castle and when the police had made their inspection trips. He had also flooded the moat to keep visitors from the castle, but had not seen Nancy and George anchor the drawbridge and thought it was out of order. "'Have you any idea who took my car from the motel parking lot?' Nancy asked. "'Yes, Clara Oman did that, too. She and my husband were the ones who kidnapped Mr. Wheeler, and it was Rudy who sent the note to Mrs. Hempstead telling her you were using an assumed name. That was meant to scare you out of town.' He tried to run down you and your friends in a boat, too. About an hour later, word came that the police of Pleasantville had taken Rudy Raspin into custody. He would be brought to Deep River the next day. Celia, nearly overcome by the whole affair, was put to bed at the motel. Nancy stayed with her, partly to care for the distraught woman and partly to be sure she did not run away. Nancy knew the police would want to question her. In the morning, two officers appeared and took Celia Raspin with them. She had barely left when Nancy's father arrived with Mr. and Mrs. Bowen. They were overjoyed to hear the good news. "'We are glad our granddaughter is happy,' said Mrs. Bowen. "'And if the Armstrongs agree, we'd like to talk with her.' Mr. Bowen spoke up. My wife and I have decided to go back to Africa as missionaries. We want so much to help underprivileged people. The Bowens have asked me, said Mr. Drew, what I advise. I strongly believe that Joni should know the whole story and that we should retrieve her stolen inheritance. The lawyer went on to say that through the postcard clue, he had located the O-man's daughter, Claire, in California. She admitted using phony and forged papers to impersonate Joni. Claire claims she has none of the inheritance left, but she didn't sound very sincere. 
I asked her a few leading questions, and I'm inclined to think her parents have retained the bulk of the money. Bess groaned. But if they have it hidden away, they'll never tell where it is. Suddenly Nancy's eyes sparkled. I have a hunch as to why the O-mans and the rest of the thieves were using the abandoned castle to hide something. Girls, it's perfectly safe out there now. Let's go and make a real search. She asked her father if he wished to go along. Mr. Drew smiled but shook his head. I must see the Armstrongs, he said. You girls make your search and I'll let you know later today what the rest of our plans will be. Excitedly, the three girls set off in the convertible. On the way to the castle, they discussed what would be the most likely hiding place for thieves to use. I'm sure it's the cellar, said Nancy. You remember the only time we were warned away from the castle was when George and I swam over and started for the cellar. This time the girls were armed with three flashlights, and the weird, dank passageway of the castle did not seem so forbidding. Their hunt revealed nothing until they came to what looked like a dungeon with a barred door. It was not locked, and they went inside the cell-like room. Although they beamed their lights all around the walls, nothing suspicious was revealed. I think if there is anything hidden here, it will be under this earthen floor, said Nancy. It would be easy to dig up. She sprawled full length on the ground. What in the world are you doing? Bess asked. Looking for a hump in the earth, even a slight one. Suddenly Nancy stood up and dashed toward the corner of the dungeon. Here's one, she said. Now, what can we dig with? George remembered that she had seen a shovel in the old kitchen and hurried off to get it. She came back with the long-handled shovel and at once began to dig. In a short time, she uncovered a large brass box. Their pulses quickening, the girls lifted it out. "'You open it, Nancy,' said George. Nancy lifted the lid, and the three girls gasped. The chest was filled with negotiable securities and money. Besides these, the girls found a list of people who had been swindled and also the names of two other couples in the gang. We'd better bury this again, Bess said, and let the police come for it. Before Nancy could answer, George protested, No, sir! After all the trouble we've had, I'm not going to let one of those crooks come here and take this fortune away. I think you're right, said Nancy. Since the chest was very heavy, all three girls helped to carry it to the car. Nancy drove at once to Deep River Police Headquarters. Chief Burke was amazed to receive the cash and said he would put it in his office safe at once. Then we'll round up those four other people in the gang whose names are on the list, he told the girls. I have an idea that now the entire gang is accounted for. Nancy smiled and thanked the chief for all his help. She did not tell him that there was still one matter to clear up, that of Jody Armstrong's reunion with her grandparents. When Nancy and her friends reached the motel, they found Mr. Drew, Mr. and Mrs. Armstrong, and the Bowens there. All looked very pleased. Nancy's father, smiling, said, The Armstrongs want Jody to meet Mr. and Mrs. Bowen tomorrow. They've invited the rest of us to come to their home after they've all spent an hour together. The following day, when the Drews, Bess, and George arrived at the Armstrong home, they found an excited and happy group. Jody rushed up to the girls and hugged them. Oh, I have so many wonderful things to thank you for, she said. And don't you think I'm about the luckiest girl in the whole world to have such wonderful adoptive parents and to have found these marvelous grandparents? They've told me a number of things about my mother and father who passed away when I was very young. How they loved me and how happy they would be to know I have such fine adoptive parents. You certainly are fortunate, said Nancy, smiling. 
We're all so happy for you. Mr. Drew announced that about half of Grandma Horton's stolen securities had been found intact in the brass box at police headquarters, and that in due course Jody would receive it. The lawyer explained, What started the Omans on their kidnapping idea, and having their own daughter pose as the Horton beneficiary, was the fact that Ben Oman had seen a copy of the will. The age of the granddaughter was not mentioned, nor any guardian. It was then that he began formulating the fraud. He kept little Joni out of sight. Poor Grandma Horton was underfed and kept under sedation until her death. How perfectly dreadful, Bess said softly. Before a physician was called to administer to her, Mr. Drew went on. Mrs. Oman took little Joni to the Adoption Society and left her so no one coming to the house ever saw her. How can people be so wicked? George burst out. Jody said that of course it would be very nice to receive the money. But I'm going to give a lot of it to my grandparents to use in their work, she said. Part of what I have left will be for beautiful presents for Nancy Drew, Bess Marvin, and George Fane, she declared. They deserve the best rewards in the whole world. Nancy laughed. That is sweet of you, Jody. But the only reward I want is to know what those strange code words, wolf's eye, mean. Jody went to the bookcase and began looking in dictionaries and encyclopedias and other reference books. Nancy, meanwhile, could not help but wonder when she might encounter as strange a mystery as the recent one. Such a case was to confront her soon, the clue of the whistling bagpipes. Jody had been consulting one of the reference volumes which contained interesting information about all sorts of unusual subjects. Excitedly, she cried out, I found it! Jody giggled. Nancy, believe it or not, Wolf's Eye is a nickname for Moonstone! The End <laughs> 